Osborne, is it? I believe so. I believe it is Osborne. Osborne yeah. with, uh, uh, I think I've heard of the man. Um, uh, you're here with, uh, you have a Dances with Films official selection. You are uh, the, the film Favor. Yes. Yeah. I'm very much looking forward to seeing Favor. Uh, this is playing this Saturday over at the Chinese Theaters at Dances with Films. Yep, at 5 o'clock. You know the thing about you and me, Marv? We've got a lot of history. We go back a long time, and that means something. You were the guy that I could always count on to be down for anything. You used to say you could tell how good a friend is by whether or not they'd help you move a dead body. Guilty. <laughs> I need your help. I need your help moving a dead body. Sing me a song of redemption. Sing a little prayer for me. I live the life full of misgivings. Somebody come and rescue me. What are you doing here? I want what you owe me. After what I did for you, I don't owe you anything. Baby, midnight's coming. I don't do everything that you want, then you're gonna run off to the cops. Just me and the mean old moon's gonna I managed to keep my mouth shut. are my friend, right? Yeah. Then you best keep me believing it. Five o'clock. That's very important. Uh, you, uh, you're here. We have uh, this film that has also starring uh, film snobbery live alum Blaine Weaver uh, as well. Uh, what's the film about? Well, the film is based on the idea uh, that a friend helps you move, but a really good friend helps you move a body. Uh, Blaine Weaver and another actor, Patrick Day, play two friends. Uh, one of them has a body. He needs disappearing and the other one offers to help him disappear it uh, and in doing so it sort of upends the balance of power in their relationship and the whole thing spins out of control you know they say write what you know film what you know uh, how much experience did you have moving bodies before you started filming favor I mean, if I had a dime for every body I'd have to move, I'd have a lot of dimes. Let me say that. You know, actually, it's how I raised money for the film. Put an ad on Craigslist. Hey, you know, if you need a body being helped move, uh, happy to do it. You know, rates negotiable, and we raise money that way. As a director, how are you on set to work with? Are you, are you kind of like a bot? You know, every word of the script is is you know sacrosanct type of deal, or are you just like, okay, this is the gist of what this scene is about. Get me there. Well, you know, I, I wrote it as well, so I, I, I could have been a total word Nazi. Um, I don't think I am. I, I basically, um, you know, I don't really sit there and look at the script and be like, okay, well, you missed that. And, you know, I sort of like, if I, we rehearsed it a lot, and we, I worked with them, and there were some places they would improv, and, and, and we rehearsed like for weeks before we shot. And they'd improv, we added into the script, stuff like that. Um, so it, my thing was, as long as I recognized the scene, you know, there are certain things that words have to play off each other, and sometimes we actually would start going far afield on their coverage. And I'm like, I got to bring you back something closer because when I do this person's coverage, it ain't gonna match if she's sticking the script and you're not. So, um, but for the most part, you know, as long as it's as long as it sounded like the scene to me, I was good with it. And what's great is that a lot of stuff they did come up with, little things, made it sound more naturalistic. And also, they came up with some great lines that I totally take credit for, um, <laughs> like written by Paul Osborne. Oh, that line. Yeah, sure, Pat Day came up with it, but, you know, uh, it goes to me. It goes to you. Now, um, because Blaine is also a director, um, you know, he has Six Month Rule out on DVD right now. Um, <laughs> you also have, so two directors on set, but one of them is an actor, is yeah. the is the actor. Um, is it, do you ever get notes from him, or do you ever get a look from him going like, really, that's, what, that's, your, that's your move? That's what we're going to do in this scene? All right, pal. <laughs> no, exactly the opposite, because he gets it. So, uh, you know, uh, Pat, now Patrick Day is also a director. He's done a lot of stage and stuff. And, but he's, he approaches it very much as an actor. He's, he's very much, you know, if I, need, if I need him to turn to camera to get a certain angle because it looks cool, I usually will come up with a reason why his character would turn. With Blaine, I can go, just do a thing. And he goes with the camera and goes, oh, you want, like a, you want like a thing. Like he gets kind of, <laughs> he knows the short Because it, it looks cool. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. So it's sort of a, a way to go. It's great. I mean, he, um, 
it, it's and it's also good because I could sort of send him on directing missions, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Like we have an actor on set who uh, maybe wasn't quite uh, off book yet, and I'd be like, hey, why don't you go um, run lines with this person? Just tell him that you don't know the lines and him or her, and go and run and see. What, and he'll go off and kind of. Be my he'll go life. off and he'll, he'll go life. snort a lot of coke and you'd be like, no, I meant run lines, no, not do lines. He'll be my splinter director. No, he's always <laughs> coked up. We actually uh, diet coke. Diet coke. Coke Zero. The one, the one diva moment he had was we had Coke Zero on set. He said, hey, this is not the same as diet coke. And we actually had to stop to send a runner out to get diet coke <laughs> for a scene. Somehow I, I believe that. Yeah, like no, I totally believe Blade would totally was, do that. Yeah, it was the diva moment. That was it right there. Homeboys earned it though. He's a hard, he's a hard worker. But you know that that said though, um, you know you you're you're in L.A., which is I know a really hard place to find actors. Oh. I mean it's just it's a it's a veritable wasteland of just non non working people yeah. in this industry. And so my question is like, why Blaine and why Pat? It, you know rather than you know. Um, the guy who runs the convenience store down the road or your local barista or, you know, other people who, you know, they would be other obvious choices for these people in these roles. Well, it, the funny thing is I do know a lot of really, really good actors, and uh, it's it's actually frustrating because it takes a couple of years to make a film, and if there's no role for them, I don't get to work with you for the next, you know, four years, two plus, you know. So uh, it's it's sort of frustrating. With Blaine and Pat, you know, I, 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 I was friends with both of them, and I'd seen, but I'd also seen their work. And I was also a fan. So I sort of had it, you know, it's sort of like when you, if you own a hangar, you want to write a film around your hangar. I knew these two great actors. I'm like, I want to write a film for Patrick Day. I want to write a film with Blaine Weaver. I want to work with these guys. And at some point I had the epiphany, why don't I write a film for both of them at once? And that's actually how the whole thing started. I was like, I looked, I came up with characters for them, created a relationship that they would have, and then thought, well, how am I going to make this interesting? Well, I'll throw something into the mix that that takes this, the power of their relationship and, and upends it, upends everything they have going on. Um, it's sort of an exploration of, of um, how precarious human relationships really can be and how little, how, how, how they're sort of on a thin wire sometimes and you snap that wire and, and all hell breaks loose. And so it was, it was fun to write something for both of them and, and they'd never worked together. They didn't really, they sort of knew each other but they hadn't, didn't see each other in about 10 years or something and they never acted together and I sort of gambled on the fact that they would have good chemistry together. Um, but that's basically what it was I wrote for them. And the sad thing is, is on this festival run, I've met several other actors like John Woods and Dan and Dangerous who I'm like, I want to work with them now. Like, I, got, I have to write something for like six different people now, or 10 different people, 12 different people. So that back to the festival, uh, not necessarily Dance with Films, but festivals in general. Yeah. So among many other things that you're known as, one of them is, is known as the director of Official Rejection. Yes. And now you have a movie that's out, on, a movie that is about, it's a documentary if you guys haven't seen it, it's like should be required viewing for everybody. Um, I, I've said it before, not just because the man is sitting next to me, but it really should be. It should be in every film school ever. You. You're welcome. Um, one of my favorite, favorite documentaries of all time. Um, yes. Wow. Yeah. You beat the shit out of Grey Gardens. Yeah! So, <laughs> so that said, though, you are the man who basically made the documentary saying, like, fuck you, film festivals. Um, well, kind of. Uh, sort of. Not really at all. But you made, you know, you, you, um, it was somewhat of an expose, you know, from your experiences and other experiences yeah. of guys, even like Blaine Weaver, on the festival circuit. And, um, now you have a movie on the festival circuit again, and uh, my question is: Is were you at all concerned that people, festival programmers, etc., would look at your resume and say like, "Oh, this asshole," uh, you know, <laughs> or or were you concerned about like they should be worried about my being an asshole for completely different reasons? Yeah, I'm an asshole anyway. No. Uh, you know, I, I was a little worried about it, but actually, official rejection did really well on the festival circuit, and they were about half the festivals shunned us, but half were like. Please come. Sc- we screened it like I've lost count of how many like thirty festivals screened official rejection, and it played for like three years at festivals. It was after we were like on DVD and and you could get us online, and we were we were still playing. So um, I actually hope that would help us <laughs> way more. Uh, but it's funny, like you know, we made official rejection, and and this is my third movie on the circuit now. So you sort of you do sort of you become exempt from certain things. Like you're not a first timer anymore. You're a little more of a known commodity. There's festivals that you can you can contact directly. You don't have to go through the you know the channels where you can get a waiver to submit at least and you know there's there's it, it's, a little, it's a little and you're also smarter about where to submit you're not just like going i want to submit to everything who t- take me you're a little more shrewd um but you're not exempt from all the politics it's kind of sad so it's sort of like all these things on i've preached about that i would hope i would hope would change 
you know, from official rejection. Like, this, this will, I will talk about this, and it will be exposed, and it will change. No, I'm still stuck. I'm still screwed by the same stupid rule here and there. Um, so, yeah. Swag bags are better, though. The swag bags are better? They've, they've gotten, like, uh, overall, like, swag bags were almost always just ads. And now there's actually a couple of pens in there and a few useful things. There was, like, a coupon for – this was stolen out of my swag bag for dances. Or, or, or at least it went missing the night of the, of the party. I had, like, they had, like, a, um, like a three-day pass for Brooke Williams in the swag bags. Really? Yeah. I, like, it's like a spa pass. And I got home, and it wasn't there anymore. Wife took it. No, the wife – I was going to give it to the wife. She's like, I have a spa pass. I can't find it. Oh, she's like, why did you even tell me it exists? Like, just lie to me, Nick. <laughs> find it first. Because now I know I don't have it, even though two seconds ago I didn't know it existed. Um, so the swag bags are better at dances, specifically. Well, over, but think, overall. Overall at festivals. But in regards to dances with films, why why there? Like, why submit to there? Is it just because it's a local, it's a Hollywood festival? Or is it because, you know, you were, because you were at, you debuted, uh, premiered alongside some other people over at the Phoenix Film Festival recently. Now you're back here in, you know, Hollywood. Right. Uh, why Dances with Films? Or was it because, um, it was just on the list? Have you played there before? What's your deal? Well, I hadn't played there before. Uh, actually, I'm, f I'm friends with Robin Latz, who used to run San Diego, and she's friendly with, with, uh, the Dances pe folks. So I'd heard good things about it. Friends of mine have played it before. Um, but, you know, it, the big thing, and this is the big selling point that festival has overall, is that you do get to screen at the Chinese theaters. That's huge. And, and before that, it was the Sunset Five, also huge. Like, they're very smart about picking great venues in the city. And from what I hear, I, they're Nazis about good projection. Like, you know, we want you to get DCPs, and we want you to do these things. So it's sort of like, oh, well, I'm going to play there. I'm going to get a great screening. Uh, at a, a local theater, and I'm gonna have I'm gonna get my cast and crew there. I mean, renting a theater is like three thousand dollars. It's fucking insane, and uh, you know, getting to play there, it's like it's the cost of the submission. If you're lucky enough to take you, and you can play there for basically they'll they'll play you, and so it's a great. I don't know. I mean, when you make a film in L.A. and you're from L.A., there's you definitely have um, you have skin in the game, and you want to make sure that when you do finally premiere in Los Angeles. It's good, you know. Like you want, like you don't want your cast to come to your garage and watch a movie. You want them to go somewhere. Wow! So like people, we shot, we shot um, in this one house in our movie, and the two people who are there, they're like in their seventies. Um, they're so excited to come see the movie. They bought a whole score of tickets. They're gonna bring a bunch of friends. They're like, wow, you know, like we've been going to the Chinese theaters our whole lives, and we love the the, the six, and we're gonna go there. And they're so excited to come see, you know, what we did in their house <laughs> on screen. <laughs> Um, and that's really the big appeal for dances. There's a couple of really good local festivals that really embrace these dances. With one is one, uh, LA United is another one that I really like. Um, so we just, I thought I'd submit there. I, we, we didn't hit the the deadline for LA United, so but we hit it, dances. We were in time, so I was like, let's submit there, and uh, it worked out. So. Um, I'm sure I know that you're definitely you know you're busy when it comes to you know you had. You know, you know, official rejection, and then you're a writer as well, so you're writing and writing, and you got favor. Did you have any anything else that you were also thinking about doing before favor, and so or instead of favor, um, but you were like, no, you know, I have the resources just to do this now, so let's do this one first, or is that how? What is like? What is your your decision process when you're actually going ahead and saying like, this is the film we're going to make next? Wow, uh, good question. Um, I, what I thank you. I've done this once before. <laughs> what happens is that I finish a movie, and usually because you know. These days, filmmakers are so involved with the release and with all the marketing and everything else. You don't just make a movie and then let go and go on to your next film. And you know, most of us have have to go out and earn money doing day jobs. I edit professionally, um, so you know, usually once the film's been put to bed, I go back into the writing cocoon, as I call it, and I said I just spew out stuff, stuff that's been stored up for a couple of years. So I spewed, I think, like eight scripts in this short, like six month burst of time, and one of them was Favor. A lot of them are crap. There's actually there's one called. Uh, it's great that you could recognize that though, because not a lot of writers can. Well, sometimes you just. I just. I honestly. I try not to to, to limit myself. I just whatever you want to just spew out, just spew it out now, and out of there will come some things that come from genuine inspiration. And there's there were two that came out of that that I really want to make, and one was favor, and the other one is called Small Hours, which I wrote also for Patrick Day, and we're hoping to make that one next, but I'm going back into the writing cocoon now, so we'll see what else um, comes out that may supersede it. Um, but basically, you sort of look at, I, I take the pile of crap, and usually there's one or two things in that you, and I, and I also circulate them through my little trusted 
circle of people. If you act, I notice I haven't gotten anything, so I'm not a trusted <laughs> circle. Well, maybe not yet. Uh, but you know, it's like you know, you, my, my my wife is my producer, so she gets them, and then there's a few other people on that list, like six or seven people that get them. And the two year old, the two year old, and and usually it's and, and I don't get a lot of feedback. It's usually like either it works or it doesn't. Like great or no, it's pretty much how it goes. Uh, but if I if something goes out that seems to be people seem to respond to and 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 I really get passionate about it then at that point we start thinking about production with you know, small hours we're we're trying to figure out the money situation right now we'd like to make it a little bit bigger than favor um, but there's one there's one in that pile of scripts called uh, called um, what is it called it's called uh, a machete a machete wielding lesbian machete wielding lesbian zombie nymphos I think is the name of it and it, it's I'm about, in. it's about Machete wielding lesbian zombie nymphos. There's a point for a part for Lloyd Kaufman in the film. Nice. Uh, his name, I think, his name is Boyd Goffman. Boyd Goffman. Yeah, yeah. That's, that sounds like a trauma movie waiting to happen. It's it's is it's as classy and intelligent as it sounds, and it is full of machete wielding lesbian nymphos. nympho zombies. It's it's um, it's the kind of highbrow art you can expect from a Paul Osborne production. Yeah, I've seen a lot of Merchant Ivory films, and I felt that that really captured the essence of a Room of the View, for example. Notice that one didn't get made. <laughs> it's still, it's still, somebody's like, oh my God, you're so talented. You can, I'm like, yeah, but, but I wrote this, you know. <laughs> but I wrote, I wrote it in a week, and I was like, I was just, I'm going to write this fun, just ridiculous thing. <laughs> and I spat it out. And it's even faux doc style. <laughs> it's even like his interviews and of characters who have already been killed. I just got killed, you know, and stuff like that. It's very weird. WTF. Uh, yeah. My head. Uh, <laughs> I said to Patrick Day, and he's just like, he's right back, no. <laughs> How it was? No, but yes. Yeah, you're not. You're not always brilliant, asshole. That's what it was. Do you think it, it, you have to get all that out to get to the core of like maybe a more serious movie where you're like, okay, now I can take myself seriously because I'm I've got all the silly out. So like now I'm actually gonna turn out something that's fun or something that actually makes sense. Yeah, you do. I think that, you know the best way to write is at least in the first draft is really not to edit yourself. It's just to kind of go bleh, and, you know, and do it rapidly. Like really, just get into that little world and just you know that for me that's a sort of an. Uh, uh, a fairly natural state, like it's not, and it's not work. It's a lot of work to write. But a lot of people I know are like, I, I, an actor friend of mine, Lev, is like, he's writing a script now, and he writes his own material. He's a brilliant actor, but he's always like, man, the writing is so hard for me. Don't you agree? I know how, you know, you and I know how hard it is. And I go, for me, like it would be the other way around. Like if someone forced me to act, <laughs> I'd be suffering. But like writing is like, yeah, it's it's a lot of work, but that's where I'm most comfortable. And that's honestly everything else I do is a life support system for that. Like I write the story, I really believe it, and I want to get it on screen. So yeah, I'll produce, I'll direct, I'll you know go out and promote it because I, it's all really supporting the core of who I am, which is a writer. Where are uh, you in favor going after Dances with Films? We're simultaneously playing the same weekend at uh, the Dead Center Film Festival. Same day, same time, 5 o'clock, Dead Center. Uh, thanks, Dances. I let you guys know about that screening, and you still scheduled me at exactly the same time, so I couldn't possibly attend both. You know, I'm a double award winner you know what? At, you know, at Dead Center. Uh, yeah. I won, I've won two awards there, Facial, facial Rejection and Tentaloon. And uh, Blaine's double award winner there. He won for Weather Girl and for Outside Sales. And we met there. And so there's a great story that basically favor wouldn't exist if not for the awesomeness that is Dead Center. It's one of my favorite festivals. But I'm missing it. Thanks, Dances. Yeah, and Blaine, will, Blaine and Leva will be there. So. But, but uh, Dances with Films did give you the opportunity to basically have a simultaneous day and date release across the country-ish. Ish. Uh, halfway. Halfway. Literally. What, one coast to the dead center. center. And then the weekend after that, we're playing uh, at the Waterfront Film Festival, which they still... What's that? It's in uh, South Haven, Michigan. Oh, okay. Now, I, I'm, I've never been. We played official rejection there. It was the same weekend as Dead Center, but I chose Dead Center. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, <laughs> which well, I was not unhappy about. I love Dead Center. Uh, but Waterfront is... Uh, friends of mine who played this, hey, it's fantastic. It's like another Phoenix. It's so good. And uh, they were kind enough to, to program this one. So this year it's not the same time as any of these other weekends. One weekend later, so I can go. And uh, Gary King played Sherman Song there last year. And he said that the, the crowds were nuts. Like it was like every screening was really full. It was in, New, in Saugatuck, Michigan. And it moved to South Haven. And I was concerned. And they, the festival was like, no, you don't understand. Like this whole region's full of these little beach communities. And we made them bid on, like the cities bid on which one would get us because we're so successful there. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I want to say thanks for coming over and, and kind of talking about Favor and talking about your process a little bit with us. Um, again, everyone, watch it Saturday at uh, June... June 8th? June 8th. June 8th. I almost 8th. said 8th. At 5 o'clock. Yeah. Yes, over at the Chinese Theaters over in uh, Hollywood. Um, 
Thanks, man. It was, it was good to see you, as always, and, and great to finally get you on, yes, on wax, I, as it were. I have no kid with a broken arm this time, so thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> Anytime, sir. So thank you very much. See you soon.